Thank you. So, thank you very much. Let me. <laughs> let me. <laughs> thank you very much. <laughs> thank you. Let me. Let me first of all recognize my friends and colleagues, uh, Honorable Dr. McIntyre, who is our Member of Parliament for Wharton Waven, Honorable Ian Douglas, Honorable Miriam Blanchard, Honorable Robert Town. We have also Honorable Peter St. Jean, Honorable Dennis Charles, and our friend Nicole, Nicole Zalshanks Esprit. And to all of you, the wonderful people of the Rosa Valley, I am very happy to be here in Wharton Waven this evening. And I will be very short with you this evening until my presentation, because I would like to give you an opportunity to ask your questions and to make your suggestions. I know we have the, in coming to Wharton Raven, one of the major challenges which you always lamented to us was your road, and in particular, the, the bridge joining with uh, Trafalgar and the main road from Wharton Haven all the way down to Copter. We've all recognized that we have started the road. We could have been much further with the road, but understand this. The government has taken a deliberate decision to engage local people to construct this road. We could have given the contract to a big firm to do and denied the opportunities to many of you, the local contractors in this community. So we are going in that pace because we are seeking to carry along with us the number of local contractors because they all have different capacities. And we are ensuring that when the millions are spent on building these roads, these millions will stay in the pockets of the people of Wharton Waver. So what you have seen is the first phase of the improvement of this road. And the minister has indicated to you there is an additional $600,000 to be spent. And in the budget coming up, we will put a significant amount of money to take us, take this road all the way down to the bridge down in Copton. So when you'll be driving into Wharton Haven, you'll be driving on a much more improved and safer road. And as far as practically possible, as you've seen, we've studied to do, is that where we can widen it, we will widen it. And there's some areas where the edge failures will put in some retaining structures and seek to widen the roads, because in some areas it is almost impossible to widen it. But we'll ensure, as far as practically possible, we will make the road much more accessible to all of us who use there from time to time. And on, along that road, there are two areas, I believe, two crossings, which we have to improve and allow it to be, um, to allow for two vehicles to, to drive on rather than this one vehicle that is currently the case. And, and the bending nature of those crossings. So the, this road project is well on its way, ladies and gentlemen, and I give you the assurance that we will complete this road, utilizing local contractors. And I must commend the local contractors. Yeah, for real, for real. You know, because when the work is not done properly, we criticize. When it's done properly, we have to praise the people. And, and I know when we started, there were some challenges. But the contractors were very amenable to instructions and guidance. And they were able to work with the engineers in the Ministry of Public Works and get to the level at which we wanted them to get to. And I believe all of us could say that we are satisfied with the end product thus far. We're also committing there are some additional roads within the village itself, which we must do. We have Kautang or the inner village road. And then we have the road lower down from, um, from screws that we have to improve. And we also have the upper village to the island house, which we also have to complete. So those three roads, the funds will be made available. 
and we will utilize the local VIC here to assist us in implementing these projects to the benefit of the residents of Wharton Waven. So we are aware of your issues, and I personally am aware of your issues. Um, I am not speaking to you in abstract. I'm speaking to you in a practical, knowledgeable way about the way of life of the people of Wharton Waven. Washrooms, there are 18 people so now who require washrooms. Those funds will be sent to the VIC. Is it VIC call it or the VIC call it? Um, and 18 people at $11,000 each for a washroom. That those funds will be sent before the end of June to the community um, improvement committee to assist us in building washrooms for the people of Wharton Waven. You had a meeting, which was convened and organized by your power rep, Dr. McIntyre, with the small business unit to look at how can we work with you to improving your small businesses. Because I must say that in Wharton Waven, we have very many enterprising people. People who are, and you have more self-employed people in Wharton Waven per capita than many parts of the world, I believe. And, and we have to see how we can continue to work with you to sustain your businesses. Sometimes you need a little cash injection to buy more raw, raw material or to buy a new fridge, you know, or to buy more craft or to, or to manufacture more craft, to make more pepper sauce and so forth. And how can we work with you to ensure that the job that you've created for yourself and the jobs that you created for your fellow man, we can assist you in maintaining this. What we will do tonight is to make a commitment, because I have seen everybody who attended this uh, meeting. I have, I, have, I have a list of what business you engage in, and I also have a list of what you would like the help for. So we have, I have this list. Dr. Makita gave me a copy of it. And the amount on this list comes up to $556,000. That's the request of the people who submitted proposals. I am not here to tell you that I can give you the 556 all at once. But what I'm saying to you is that I'm making a commitment now of $250,000 to go towards this, and then we will do a second tranche to assist you with your small business. I am saying to the vendors, and I raise this matter in cabinet every time, and I raise it all the time, that we have to fix the vending situation in Wharton Waven. You know, and when I look at the list, about 17 of you who are vending up there, and most of you are women, you know, working hard to take care of your families. And whether it is rain or sun, you're there standing, trying to see what you can sell. There are times you have a good day, and there are times you have a bad day. But you wake up the next morning, and you set up your stall, waiting for the first tourist to come. You know, so I have the highest personal regard for people who work hard and who try to take care of their families. And the vendors of Dominica and the vendors of Wharton Waven, we have, to, as a government, we must continue to assist you to ensuring that you can have a decent living from this enterprise. Because you have but a few months of the year to work, and then you have a period where you're out of season, so to speak. And you have to try to make enough money during those months to assist in taking care of yourself in the months when there are no cruise ships coming to the country. Because for some of you, you depend solely on the cruise dollar, on the tourism dollar to survive. And what I would like us to do is to move towards acquiring some of the properties up there and to build uniform stalls for the vendors of Wharton Waven. And, and, and have it in the, done in a way that is aesthetically appealing. That when the tourists come, the stalls themselves are attractions. You understand? And then you have the amenities, the washrooms, that you can feel free to go. We should not now, in the second decade of the 21st century, have vendors have to go and beg somebody to use the washroom and so forth. 
And I want us to sit down, Dr. McIntyre, immediately and let us put the plans and let me tell me how much money we need for us to build the stalls for the, for the vendors of Wharton Waven. As the Minister of Finance, I am making a public commitment that the government will provide the funds to construct these um, facilities for you. I want to say to you, the parents, and to all the young people listening to me, the children of Dominica listening to me, I am very concerned about the tendency of us to take things for granted. When we had what we call a common entrance and we had to fight for the few spaces, children studied, parents stayed up with the candles and the, and the, and the lamps and to ensure that our children study. We, we force our children to listen to the news. We make them read. But because we have more opportunities now than we as parents had before, I get the sense that not only children are taking things for granted, but parents are taking things for granted. And I am saying to you, my dear brothers and sisters, that we must take advantage of the opportunity. Because when you acquire an education, it is different from acquiring a car. Nobody can take this from you. Your education will not crash. Your qualification will not crash. It is an important aspect of life that can help take you out of poverty, that can help, that you can use as a tool to make a living. And with universal access to secondary education, which means that from 2005, since 2005, Every child in Dominica has a space at a secondary school. And this was achieved because this government recognized the importance of education and recognized that education should not be for a few people in Dominica. That education must be made available to everybody, irrespective of your station in life, irrespective of the circumstances of your family. And when I went to the cabinet in 2002 as the Minister of Education, and I said to the cabinet, I want to launch a program to achieve universal access to secondary education by 2007. We were able to front load the investments in education and achieve it two years in advance, in 2005. And it was a deliberate attempt because coming from the, the principles of the Dominic Labour Party, that everybody must be subjected to the opportunities. We had to address this. The state college, for example, and all the young people who are at the state college and you dress nicely and you have this, 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 this splashing um, facility, that did not come just because it is government's responsibility because we didn't have it before. We didn't have it before. But we recognize that our children needed to have access to education beyond secondary school. And when I taught at the college, before we got the CXC results, the college had already determined how many students it will accept at the college. And when, as fate would have it, I became the Minister of Education a few years later. And immediately upon becoming the Minister of Education, I commissioned the study to examine for me the situation confronting tertiary education in Dominica. And that study was done by Dr. Th by Dr. Thomas, a Dominican, and Dr. Donald Peters. And they came back and they told me in a report, a very thick report, that only 7% of all high school graduates in Dominica had access to the college. 7%. And it is not because the rest of them did not meet the qualifications to enter the college, but because of the way the system operated. And I used to see a number of children from across Dominica, the children of farmers, the children of, 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 the, of the unemployed, who worked hard, got their grades at CXC, and because they came late for registration, they miss being part of the maximum number of students. 
And what I used to do, uh, because I was assigned to register students, I would register students without the principal knowing. And every year, the years I spent there teaching at the college, I would register about 20 to 30 people. And then I would tell Mr. Volney, maybe later down in the term, in the semester, that I registered additional students. And so I felt that if the Lord gave me the opportunity now as Minister for Education, I have to do something about it. And when I went to the college, not very long ago, I was the only person from my entire constituency, not, all, not, not only from Vegas, but the whole of my constituency at the college for two years. Out of 122 students who graduated at the grammar school, only 20 of us made it to the college. And grammar school in those days was the, the secondary school. So 102 of my comrades did not go to college. And we were able to address this problem in a practical manner by consolidating those colleges, creating the state college, and investing in the infrastructure, investing in the training of people. And today, we have set the foundation for there to be 100% access to the state college, providing that you, you, you acquire the minimum entry requirements into the college. And as we speak, as we speak, there is about 90% of all high school graduates now attending the college as compared to 7% when we came into office. And so when, when people sit to ask, well, what are we doing for the young people? My friends, there is nothing more you can do for a young person by giving him an opportunity to attend school. There is nothing you can do more and better for a child who comes from a, a, a parent, a single family home who's struggling to make life meet, to, to make, and to turn that child into a doctor, to turn a child into an agriculturist, to turn a child into a surveyor, and to give him the opportunity to look at the world as his, as his marketplace and make a living out of it. That's what we have been able to do. I'm looking at the numbers today. And for so far for the financial year, we have spent $15 million on students studying overseas. $15 million. Two weeks ago, I gave the Ministry of Education $7.2 million to pay for our students in Grambling and, and, and Midwestern and UWE and elsewhere. Helping the U.S. economy because we sent quite a few millions to them. And then people say, what are we doing for the young people? Fifteen million dollars. And I can tell you that this thing never used to happen. It was who you knew, knew and what surname you carried in Dominica to have gotten opportunities for this. That's why there are people in Dominica who do not like me because of what I have done to raise the standard of the working class people of Dominica. But I am who want to be vexing me because I'm helping people who are in need of help. I say to them always that you will not be vexed with me, upset with me. I am just an instrument. I am just an instrument. I am the Prime Minister today, I, can be, I, can, I, will, I will move up, move some time. But when, as long as I am there, I will do what I have to do to help the people of this country. And that's why I say to the young people, that when you get a scholarship, when you get a grant from the government, do not go to this people's country and form the fool. Stay in school. Stay in school and be positive-minded people. Do not engage yourself in unnecessary, foolish talk. Anything that is not going to elevate you, elevate your mind, enlighten you, you should not engage yourself in it. So we are committed to this. And in respect to our diplomatic relations, for example, 
When we establish relations with China, and China asked me, well, you know, how can I help? How can we help Dominica? How can we work with Dominica? The first request I made of China, the first wasn't the hospital. It wasn't the stadium. It wasn't the West Coast Road. The first request I made of China was for scholarships for our young people in Dominica. I said, I want my young Dominicans to learn Chinese or Mandarin so we can place them in a category where in the world they would be able to attract jobs. And so far, since the establishment of diplomatic relations some 13 years ago, we have sent over 100 young people to study on full-time scholarships in the People's Republic of China. And likewise, in Morocco and the other countries which we have established relations with in recent time. People in the country, they ask for this and they ask for that. But everything you ask for, there's a cost to it. And everybody knows what the government should do and should not do. But nobody is telling the government, well, how can you raise the money to do these things? And as they say, it is he who is in the kitchen who can feel the heat. And the constitution of the country places on the Minister of Finance the responsibility to fetch the money to do what the country requires to be done. And it is not an easy task. Because our economy is still small. The number of us who pay direct taxes is not large because with the changes we have made in the income tax of Dominica, we have removed thousands of people from the tax bracket in our country. We increased the tax threshold from about 5,000 when we came in to now where it stands $25,000. So which means that anybody in Dominica who is earning $25,000 a year or less pays no income tax in Dominica. And if you go beyond that, a couple hundred dollars. So the average public servant may pay a couple hundred dollars in taxes because we've reduced the bands, the rates, and we've increased the tax threshold. So if you are earning $40,000 in the public service, the first 25,000 is not taxed. You only tax on the 15,000. And we've moved from a more consumption tax approach, which means that you, you pay taxes based on how much you consume. Before that, there were direct taxes. We still have consumption tax at 25 and 30 percent. All of those taxes were removed. So in respect to the consumption tax, you pay based on how much you consume. You understand? And farmers don't pay any taxes, income tax in Dominica. And of course, the vendors would always tell us they don't make no money, so they'll fall below the 25,000. <laughs> One thing is very, very, one thing with vendors, the most, every time I meet a vendor, they never make money, you know. <laughs> you know, like Hawkstar's too, you know, I make nothing, all, all my produce get, 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 get rotten on the boat, the boat was, the engine go bad and so on. And then you go to the, to the homes, they have a big home, they have a bus, they have a car, they have a van, they have a, they have a supermarket, they have a restaurant, they have a guest house, but their produce always get rotten or spoiled, you know, on the boat and so forth. But they're my friends so I can speak like that, you know? <laughs> but seriously, 
So we do not have many people paying taxes. But we have to run the hospitals. You want more police officers in the streets. You want to ensure that when your children go to school that they have teachers to teach you. You want better roads. The small business money. Those of you who are 60 and older, and those of you who are 18 and younger, don't pay anything at the hospital, but somebody has to pay for it. And I'm, I am now battling as a minister of finance. Because in the upcoming budget, the Ministry of Health is asking for $5 million more to buy medicine. On top of what we gave them last year, they're asking for another five million dollars to buy more medication. And part of this request is that a number of people who are suffering from various forms of cancer, the medication you buy, the hospital will give it to you for free. So the government is not going to take a decision. So those of you who are suffering from diabetes and, and um, cancer, to make those drugs available to our citizens free of charge. Because we recognize that these drugs are critical to someone's to the patient's well-being. So we now have to include five million dollars more in this year's budget. Solid waste is asking for more money because it's, most of you in Dominica are not managing your waste properly. You want to send everything to the government to pick up for you and to take to Labas when half of it could stay in your backyard in a compost. Huh? I mean, everybody saying that is true. That is true. You know, I am, I am not here as a prime minister. I am here as one of you speaking to us as family. You know, we're family, so I am speaking. With you, we're engaging, we're having a conversation. So I have now to increase the budget for solid waste. Education is asking for more money. And one of the issues now with education is that the CXC is now going to have examinations online. And the Ministry of Education, the government now must buy computers for every secondary school in Dominica. So we now have to go and buy new computers and have centers established with recurrent costs because you can't have a computer room and it, it's closed and, and, and you're, not, you're, you're not maintaining it. You need to have staff to maintain it. You need to have people to, to fix them if they get bad. So there is not only going to be a capital cost to this request, there's going to have to be a recurring cost. Understand what I'm saying? Tourism. Minister Tong mentioned to you that in 2016, 2017, 275,508 cruise tourists came to Dominica. But we did not sit on our heads in Roseau and, 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 and hope that it would, be, it would be increased. We have to do a number of investments. So when people talk foolish in Dominica and talking about, oh, government doing roads all over and roads and so on, these things are critical for a tourism infrastructure. We may believe that a tourist wants the stuff in a natural way, yes, but he wants to have a proper toilet next to it. He wants to have a towel, a clean white towel. Because you can't have a black towel or a brown towel. Because the, the tourist wants to know whether it is clean. And he can't know whether it is, it is clean or dirty if a brown or black towel. So we have to invest in infrastructure. Enhance the tourism sites. In order for our numbers to get up. And the minister and, and, and all of us, we have to go and engage the cruise lines and to show them what we have done, invite them to Dominica to come and see what we have done. And as a result of this spending, we've seen this year, 
In 2017-2018 cruise season, over 422,000 cruise passengers will come to Dominica. And what that means to you, because the majority of them will come to the valley. And we have to ensure, Dr. Mag, that we help them to get as many dollars as possible from the tourists who come so we can showcase what we have in Dominica. But my caution to you, the vendors, you know, let us sell what we make in Dominica. Don't buy something from a foreign country and scratch the name outside and, and write Dominic over it. We have to, and we have to sell and showcase what we have in Dominica. So the Ministry of Tourism is asking for an increase in the marketing budget. And I am prepared as a Minister of Finance to increase the marketing budget because we have to continue promoting our country in order to bring the returns to our country. So you're talking about a significant increase that ministries are asking. And there are a number, number of the ministries asking for increase in, in, in spending. How do we get this money from? When a handful of us who work pay taxes, the majority don't. And I have not met one Dominican, one Dominican, who has told me I love to pay taxes, scary. <laughs> and and, and, and in, in this budget, I mean, putting one or two flowers inside there. I have not been one Dominican. <laughs> Including myself, I complain about the government taxing me too much. Because when I get my, 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 my pay slip and so forth, and you know, the government, the first thing they take is the tax, you know. They don't care what you have to do after that, the first thing they take is the tax. Before you get your salary, they take the money already. I'm saying, but you're taxing me too much. I mean, all that work I'm doing, you know, my salary should be much higher than what I'm, I'm, I'm getting. But the reality is, there is a certain point at which you can tax people. And I am not in the business of overtaxing people. And I recognize that Dominicans are not in a position to pay increased taxation. So how do we go about financing the budget? When manufacturers want more money at a cheaper rate, People in the tourism business want more, more money at a cheaper rate. So we have to put $15 million in the, in the, in the aid bank at 3%. Farmers say that they want some money at a cheaper rate. We have to put money, $10 million in the aid bank. The manufacturers are asking, and in the budget, I'm going to put a significant sum for manufacturers at the same 3%. What could I have done with this 15 plus 10, $25 million? Where is money going to come from? And when you contract loans, like all of us contract loans, you have to give the bank or the credit union your pay slip. And on the loan application form, those things that which are not captured in the pay slip the deductions, they'll have it in, 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 in a checkbox to tell you rent, how much you paying for rent. How much are you paying for gas every day? How much are you paying for light? How much are you paying for water? To see whether you are in a position to be able to contract the loan because your salary must be able to pay for the loan you're taking. You can't go and tell them that, you know, sometimes my daughter in, in America does send me some money. That can't work. It, they will give you a loan based on how much you're making. And I'm saying to you, my dear brothers and sisters, that it is no different on how the government functions. That if we request a loan from the World Bank, we must be able to show them. Show them how we're going to pay it, whether we have the means to pay it. That is why Mr. Minister Douglas told you, in 1999, there was no responsible financial institution who would have lent the government money in 1999. 
Because when the Caribbean Development Bank and the World Bank and all these important institutions would see your balance sheet, they would tell you, Mr. Government, we cannot give you money because you do not have the means to pay. And in a desperate, in desperate desperation, you do desperate things. And it has cost these people dearly. And that's why we have to be very careful as citizens what we ask our government to do. Because some of the things we ask our government to do in this country can place us in a difficult situation. Because you may ask the government for something, and when I study that, I say, well, if I do that, well, I'll get plenty of votes. But what's going to happen five years down the road? When the chicken comes, comes to roost? When the grace period for the loan has ended and you have to start paying? How are you going to pay? You now have to go back to an austerity program. Impose levy. Impose taxes. You remember one year we even imposed a, a, a tax on, on bicycles. The difficult period. First we have taken 4% on people's salary every month. The levy, you remember the levy? Number of taxes to, 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 to make things right. And the people of this country suffered. All of us suffered. We saw a dramatic decline in our way of life. Poverty increased. And we have systematically gone about addressing the matter. And so we have to be very, very careful as citizens of our country about asking our government for things that cannot be done. And this is why, my dear brothers and sisters, because you can raise funding, revenue, through taxes, or the sale of assets, land, and so forth, some grants, and loans. And I can tell you, I have been around for some time. Outside of Ralph Gonzalez in St. Vincent and Grenadines, I'm the longest person around the table of heads of government in CARICOM. So I've been around for some time. And I have never seen the world more uncertain as it is now than ever before. Countries now are becoming, becoming very individual, individualistic. You understand? And there are some parts of the world where there are challenges. So it means, therefore, we have to recognize that this ship called Dominica, we now have to take our oars and row our boat by ourselves. That what we, need, what we want to achieve for our country must be done by Dominicans. Because where you would have gotten 50 or 60 million dollars in grants, that is no longer available. And you cannot impose additional taxes. And if you go and borrow recklessly, you have to, you'll pay for it one day. Just imagine some of us will find ourselves in financial difficulties. You know, somebody falls sick in our, in our home, we have to find a good money to help out and so forth. You know, your daughter overseas lost her job. She, 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 she wants a lot of rent money. You know, you have nothing in the credit you're going to take for. You go to all, all those um, money giving companies. And you take your ring, your wedding ring, and you put it inside there. Yes. Yes. Huh? Yes. Am I talking about things we know? Yes. I mean, I'm not. Yes. Yes. I, I walk the streets, you know, I know what happened in America, you know, I, I shop, you know. I know the price of goods. I know how people live. And this is why we are doing things to assist you in creating a better way of life for yourself. And unfortunately, everything we try to do to help and improve the way of life, there are some who want to mash it up and criticize us. And, you know, we, we, we have to... We have to take, we have to take the discourse about the future of Dominica to a higher level. 
It can't be done by shouting on radio stations. It can't be done by lighting fires in the country. Present your case. Articulate your views. And let ideas contend. There must be a battle of ideas. If the government is doing something that you oppose, what is the practical alternative? It is not sufficient to just say, well, the government shouldn't do that. What is the alternative? That's how we engage ourselves. And if at the end of the day you have presented a constructive alternative, which the government can utilize, we'll utilize it. We'll utilize it. But I am not, I, I listen to people on the other side and try to find out what ideas do you have? Because I've always maintained this government does not have all the ideas of how to build Dominica. You understand? So we have to recognize this. And that's why I come to the point, my, my dear brothers and sisters, about this much talked about CBI, Citizenship by Investment Program. Now, Dominica is considered as this third world, you know, they have third world, first world, and second world, and, and, and third world. And there's developed and developing countries. And now they have now a new term, emerging economies. So we are a developing country. And if countries like the United States of America, which is the world's largest economy, has its own immigration program, where you can invest in a project, so just like what we do in America, a project to create jobs for people in the inner cities of America. By investing half a million US dollars, you can get your green card. What about Little Dominica for small economy? With no oil. America has oil. America has natural gas. There are all sorts of things, but they recognize that notwithstanding the fact that they are the world's largest economy, notwithstanding the fact that they have a large economy in terms of tax, tax base and so forth, it still was not enough to create the jobs and the way of improvement of the way of life of the American citizens. So they've gone to the ACLG program. Malta, who is in the European Union, has a program where you invest about 650,000 euros. And you become a citizen not only of Malta, but the European Union. Because you now have access, free access to all the European countries. And Malta has a visa free program in the United States of America. But Malta has a program. Cyprus has a program. Cyprus is in the European Union. Students do, your, do, your, do go and do your research, do your geography. So if we want to have a discussion about CBI, let us have a serious, transparent, and honest discussion about it. And if these countries recognize the importance of it, and the International Monetary Fund has cited this program as a critical element of our country's economy, not only Dominica, but all of the countries which have, which have such a program. And people make it look like it, you know, it's a bad thing to have it, and we collude with people who don't even know where Dominica was, never been to Dominica, to seek to destroy our way of life. And where is our patriotic, where is our patriotic spirit? Or nationalist spirit in defending the motherland, in defending our country. That instead of we defending our country, we go, we go in dark rooms with people who have no interest in our way of life to undermine our programs and to undermine our economy. Because 
You know they started the, the campaign, it will continue. I have seen them rehashing the same stories, unedited. Not even recognizing, okay, well, the government has done ABCD. Same thing that they had, same, same article they had five months ago, six months ago, a year. They just reaction it. And I'm saying to you, all the people of Dominica, I'm saying to you, the people of Dominica, all of us, red, white, blue, and green, whatever color we are, let me tell you something. Understand this. This is not about Roosevelt's carrot. This is about Dominica and the future of our children, the future of our country and the well-being of our country. Because our economy cannot sustain the demands that we place on it. And the CBI, the resources from that, is critical to our well-being. So I am saying to you, my dear friends, we must learn to put Dominica first. We can have our internal differences and we have to express them. But why whenever some people speak in Dominica, whenever they're quoted anywhere in the world, is something negative? I have my issues with Dominica, yes, I may have my issues, but you'll never hear me speaking ill of Dominica. And not because I'm the Prime Minister of the country. So I'm putting to you, my dear brothers and sisters, that we have to elevate the discourse in this country. Likewise, people talk about the electoral reform and this law didn't pass and so forth. I mean, men are saying no election without electoral reform. Men had candlelight vigil in Dominica. Men writing to all sorts of international regional organizations saying that they want electoral reform. Now, but how? You know, you know, because children they can't use language and so forth. You know. <laughs> because I mean if people are having sensible discussions and so on, but this thing really pisses me off sometimes the level of discourse we have in the country. Now, as it as it stands now, my dear brothers and sisters, there is no law in Dominica which gives the Electoral Commission the authority to issue national ID cards. How are you going to do it if they don't have no laws to do it? How are you going to do it? And after we have put in over $5 million in electoral reform, we say we don't want it again. And then they are, they are preying on the ignorance of some in our country and misrepresenting the facts, reading half, half of a sentence rather than reading the full sentence. And you know, and the problem with us in Dominica is that there are just too many of us who do not read for ourselves. We hear something, we believe it, once it suits our argument. And the issue about bringing voters and so forth, there is no law in Dominica that prevents from giving somebody the right to go and vote. There is also case law. The, the OECS Supreme Court has made it very clear in its ruling. And on election matters, the OECS Supreme Court is the final court. Which says that the mere provision of transportation to somebody to vote, whether it is from overseas or within the country, is not illegal. And all we are, we are seeking to do was to put that in domestic law. Because it is already law. Because the ruling of the court, especially the final court, is law. But what we go on to say in the amendment, we say unless if it is done with a corrupt intent. Unless if it is done with a corrupt intent. And we have given the OECS Supreme Court jurisdiction in America. These, these amendments were reviewed by international experts. 
The United Workers Party has two members on the commission and they had those amendments for months. And I am satisfied that Mr. Linton had a copy of it for months. That's why you see, that's why I, the first thing I told, to, told you about the children is that go to school and stay in school. This is serious business. When, and when you are in such serious positions, you have to have a basic knowledge of something. And if you do not have it, then speak to people who are experts at that and let them tell you. Because you will only stop learning when you, are, when you are dead, when you're in a coffin. Until such time, education is continuous. So that's basically what we try to do. And then you have people parading all oh, oh, this, like, like, um, we want to leave guys treating all these things. So, if we want to have a serious discussion in the matter, let's have a serious discussion in the matter, middle of this But I want to thank you very much for being here this evening and to engage in ourselves in discussion to say to you that every budget we go to parliament with there's always a justification for taxes because you build a road still look at the airport road we, have, we took a loan to build the airport road the old the the um, Nicholas Liverpool Highway. And I have an estimate there from the Ministry of Public Works just for the for a section of the retaining wall in in um in Bells. What was it, 25 or so or 35 million dollars? Where you see the drums in Bells, just the section. 35 million dollars to build a retaining wall. So it's not an easy task, my friends. We can make demands, we can make requests, but we have to be logical in our requests. And always look at it. When, my, when your children make requests on you, can you afford all the requests that you are making? And sometimes you tell your child, well, if you do well in school, I'll buy a bicycle for you. <laughs> and then somebody, something happened in the house, you know, a window break, and you have to go by the, by the Chinese and buy some windows. Or somebody broke the arm, or, the, or, your, or your daughter's sick in America, and you have to send good money for her because things tight in America. And you have to tell the child, you know, you know, I, you know, mommy had to send, send money for, for your sister in America because she, she, you know, she wasn't well, or, or your sister broke her arm, and so on. That's how it is. There are many of us here who might want a new motor car. But we just had a little extension in our house. We just stained the cupboards in our house. Little, little, um, tell my stay, take, take the cupboards. We had to replace it. So we had to drive a little old car for the time being. Some of us may want a new sofa, a new, a new, a new living room set. Because our children, little babies, and throw, throw milk on it and juice on it and all the things on it. And what we do is that we take a sheet and we cover, we cover it for the time being. I mean, that's what we do. That's what it is. Some of us you know, actually in Dominica went to buy a new, new outfit, boy checking, boy things that they can't go buy a new outfit and so on. You have to tell you have to go in the wardrobe and get the old things and, and, and put it back. That's that's how it is. So running the country, my dear brothers and sisters, is no different the way you run your family new. <laughs> You understand? And, and if you do not manage your resources properly, if you go and buy things that you can't afford, huh? you will force yourselves to go to these money lending institutions and borrow money, and then you can't pay it. So my advice to all of us is to budget wisely. Be prudent, be responsible, live within your means. If, if is, it is a, a used car you can buy, do not go and buy a, a new one. 
Not because your neighbor has a new car, you should have a new car. If your neighbor can afford it or you want to live pretty and so good for him, buy, buy a little car, wash it every day. <laughs> if it's only two of you in the house, you don't need a four bedroom house. Be the two bedroom. If when you have children, you put on an extra room. But don't want to put a big mortgage in your back and so forth, and 90% of your salary going to the mortgage. What are you going to eat? Not because they're telling you, put zero dollars down and you can take a big screen TV. They tell you, one dollar down. <laughs> and you say, what? One dollar down? <laughs> huh? And then, we... Now, to buy that TV now, it's about five pages of, 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 of contract to sign. And then the world's so small that even if you have, even if you have the best glasses in the world, you can't read that. And you sign this thing now. And then when the little grace period ends, you say, Bonjay, that, that, what happened there now? <laughs> but you watch anything in the smart TV and so on, and you, and, and, and you can download things on, online and watch all kinds of movies and so on. But you'll pay for it, darling. Huh? You'll pay for it. So we have to manage our resources prudently. That's what the government is doing. That is why when somebody asks for some, some things, I look at it, I say, I can't, I can't do it. This is why whenever I make a promise publicly or privately, I know we can keep it. So it may take a little longer, but whenever I say something, I know the, I have the means of delivering to the people of this country. Because it is... Fine, I can make outlandish commitments and gain political ground and political support, but it is not to the benefit of the people of Dominica. And we cannot always place political expediency ahead of the well-being of our country. Because the decision you take today, if it's a, if it's a bad decision, it, it will affect succeeding generations. So, my dear brothers and sisters, thank you very much for being here, and God bless you.